Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives. Jobs, incomes, debts, our own, those of our children. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. I've been a professor of economics all my life, and that has prepared me, I hope, to offer you these economic updates. Before jumping into the updates this time, I want to issue an invitation. As many of you know, every other month, I give a public talk in the Judson Memorial Church here in New York City. And the next one is scheduled for Wednesday, September 26, at 7.30. And I would like to invite any of you, either living in the greater New York area or perhaps visiting someone uh, here in the city or perhaps even on business, to come and join us. It's a chance for me to meet you and vice versa, and for me to develop some of the ideas and arguments that we present on this show in a fuller way and with the back and forth that uh, that kind of a situation allows. The Judson Memorial Church welcomes all. It's located in Washington Square, a very famous part of lower Manhattan, and the exact address is 239 Thompson Street uh, in Manhattan, New York City. So once again, consider yourself invited. Wednesday evening, 7.30, September 26, Judson Memorial Church. The first update I want to offer to you today has to do with an anniversary. To be precise, the 10th anniversary of the collapse of one of the oldest banks in the United States, Lehman Brothers uh, Bank. It collapsed in September of the year 2008, and it was the kind of celebrated beginning of the crash of global capitalism that really got going in those last three months of 2008 and into 2009 and 10. It may come as a shock to you, but that was 10 years ago. We are now September 2018, and so there's a fitting opportunity to reflect on the 10 years since that crash of economics, of a capitalist system. The second worst crash in capitalism's history, exceeded only by the Great Depression that began in 1929 and did not end until 1941. Well, what is a retrospective? What is a sense of the last 10 years? I'm going to take you very quickly through the highlights because it's an important date and an important 10 years. The first thing that happened after Lehman Brothers Bank collapsed and basically took the whole capitalist system with it was that the banks, the biggest ones in this country, Wells Fargo, Citibank, Goldman Sachs, all of them, did this remarkable thing I want to remind you of. Having given speeches all the time, their leaders, who had in their speechifying explained how the government doesn't know what it's doing and that the best the government can do is let the bankers do their own thing and private capitalism is its own engine of growth, all that kind of talk, all these leaders of all these big banks discovered by early October of 2008 that they were bankrupt and couldn't function. So they all got in their limousines or their airplanes and went to Washington begging the government that they had made fun of to save them. And the first thing that that government did was to bail them out. That's what the rest of 2008, 9, and 10 were all about, saving the banks. And they did that by providing them with enormous amounts of money and credit, which they could not have gotten any other way. So we had the no most enormous bailout of our financial system, bankrupt by its own actions that we've ever seen. When the government was finished spending wild amounts of money to bail out the banks, it turned around and told the rest of us that now that they had spent all this money on bailing out capitalism, 
uh, they couldn't spend money on us. And so they imposed on us something called austerity. Well, in Europe, they called it austerity. They tend to call things by what they are. Here, we called it prudent fiscal policy, but it amounted to the same thing. The government went then to work to rebuild the big corporations, bailing them out, General Motors, American International Group, things like that. And there was a recovery for rich people. It's been going on the last 10 years. The result, since there was austerity for the mass of people and a recovery and bailouts for the rich, that inequality in this country, itself a cause of the crash, became worse over the last 10 years than it was in the years preceding the crash. It's like the banks. In the heat of the crash, we said, my God, they're too big to fail. We have to bail them out. They're too big to fail. Something should be done about it. Well, nothing was. So today, those same banks are bigger than they were then when it was thought that they were too big. And so where are we? Where does the retrospective, the 10 years, leave us? Well, J.P. Morgan, the largest bank in the United States, just this last week released a report predicting that the next financial crash will happen in the year 2020, less than a year and a half from right now. What a comment. Very little learned, nothing changed. The unstable capitalist system that crashed in 2008 is threatening us with doing it again. If you don't learn from history, you will be condemned to repeat it. My next update has to do with my desire to be useful to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She is by now quite famous for having uh, defeated a long-term incumbent Democrat uh, for the United States Congress in the county of Queens in, in, in New York City. Uh, this last week, she was on the CNN television program with reporter uh, Jake Tapper, and he gave her a bit of a rough time asking her uh, to explain how she could raise the money estimated by people sympathetic to her at $40 trillion over the next 10 years to pay for the education, housing, full employment jobs, and so on that her socialist platform calls for. And she had some difficulty coming up with an explanation. Well, she's not a professional economist. She's relatively new to politics. I thought she deserves a bit of a pass. Mr. Tapper seemed to be more interested in suggesting a very old gambit, namely that people on the left propose things and do not understand how expensive they are, which isn't true. But so let me be of some help. How might we come up with the money to do the kinds of socialist programs that Bernie Sanders, or for that matter, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez advocates. It's not a big problem, and the solution is easy to explain. Here we go. We begin with the roughly 10 to 12 percent of Americans who are not working now but want to. This includes the officially unemployed, the people who are involuntarily part-time, that is, they want a full-time job but haven't been able to find one, discouraged workers, people who have given up looking but they really do want a job, and then a good number of those who have left the labor force over recent years but are starting to come back because they really do want a job. Roughly 10 percent, it's at least that, of the American labor force is in this group of people who want to work but have no job. Keep that in your mind, please. Now, the second statistic. The Federal Reserve Bank of uh, the United States, the Federal Reserve System, keeps a statistic called capacity utilization. It's a measure of how many of the tools, equipment, machines, factory floor space, office space, office equipment, store space, and so on, how much of it is being used and how much of it is idle, not being used. And the current measure, August 
2018, 78% of our capacity is being used. The other 22% of our capacity to produce is not being used. Okay, now I'm an economist. Let's do the simple story. Let's take the 10% of people who want a job and don't have them, and let's put them into the offices, stores, and factories where all the capacity they need to work with, tools, equipment, computers, floor space, you name it, is more than enough from what they need because more than 20% of the capacity is not used. And guess what? If you add 10% of the labor force to what's working now by putting these unutilized, unemployed people to work, you would increase output by roughly 10% in this country every year. That's $2 trillion a year. For 10 years, that's $20 trillion. That's half of what Ms. Ocasio-Cortez needs. And why don't we do that? Why don't we put the people who want a job, who deserve a job, into the places where they can do the work, their brains and muscles more than enough to work with that capacity. It's only capitalism that can't make a profit off these people that doesn't put them to work. But a socialist society that doesn't have to make profit for the individual producer, that thinks in social terms, that's where the word socialism comes from, would immediately, as Miss. Cortez, uh, uh, excuse me, Ocasio-Cortez would explain, socialism puts those people to work, gives them the job they want and need, not just because it produces all this wealth that can then be used to provide everybody in America with the education and the housing and et cetera. It's the jobs that's the core measure. And for those of you that are ecologically minded, if that's more production than we need as a society, then everybody can have a shorter work week. We can solve the problem that way. But don't tell the socialist the money isn't there. Capitalism can't raise the money to solve these problems. Socialism can. And Ms. Ocasio should have told Jake Tapper, and he should have figured it out, that more than half of it is immediately going to be provided. And here's a final thought about it. Suppose we also, knowing that the capacity we have sitting idle is 22% and the number of extra workers who are unemployed but need a job is only 10%, why don't we welcome immigrants? They can come in and produce still more wealth, allowing even more of the socialist project to be realized. Come on, folks. You know. Next update. Colin Kaepernick, very famous football player, was put on an ad this last week and a half by Nike. And in the ad, his face is shown, and he says, believe in something even if it costs you everything, which is a kind of summary of what happened to him in the NFL. I was struck because the statistics show that uh, two-thirds of Nike sneaker customers are under 35. And Nike said that those people would support Colin Kaepernick a lot more than they would criticize him the way Trump has done. Turns out they were right. Sales of Nike went up. Stock price of Nike went up. And by Nike using Colin Kaepernick in this way, guess what? They were also able to hide the fact that they exploit horribly in many parts of Asia child labor to produce their sneakers through direct or indirect producers. And by championing Colin Kaepernick, they were suggesting that they were on the side of social justice. Colin Kaepernick used them and they used him. And that's how capitalism works. And that's how change is actually going to come. This does it for the first half of our show today. Uh, but before leaving the first half, I want to remind you, please, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Look at our website, democracyatwork.info, how you can get more involved. And finally, thanks to our Patreon community for your ongoing support, which makes all of this possible. Stay with me. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, friends, to the second half of today's economic update. Well, we're going to spend some time with an academic, with a professor, with somebody who comes to us from the world of the university at a time when that institution in our society is under grave attack, is sub subject to political, economic, and other pressures. Big things are happening and big changes are coming. So it is with special pride that I want to welcome you to our guest and introduce him to you before we begin our conversation. His name is Michael Pelius. He is a member of the newly constituted Humanities Department at Long Island University in Brooklyn, New York. He taught philosophy there, uh, both uh, ancient and modern philosophy for the last 28 years. He's a founding member of the Institute for the Radical Imagination, uh, an experimental lift, uh, left think tank in New York. He's a co-manager of its journal, which is called Situations, a Project of the Radical Imagination. Currently, he is working on an essay, quote, Disaster Unionism, the Long Island University case and its consequences, and also on a book, uh, a long study with others entitled Techniques of Servitude from La Boétie to the Willing Slaves of Capital. Michael, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Rick. A pleasure to be here. Well, let's start. If yes. I understand correctly, and I'm a bit of a participant in this, mm -hmm. You are part of a group that is setting up a new university here in New York City. Tell us a little bit about what it is, what it's called, how people might be able to find out about it, and what its goals are. Certainly. Um, about um, 10 years ago, yourself, Stanley Aronowitz, uh, me, Bill DeFazio, and Harriet Fraud uh, got together and we wrote a, a manifesto for a left turn. And I think this was a kind of crucial moment in terms of an internal critique, if you will, of left practices. And I think in conversation since in, during that period of the 10 years, especially Stanley and myself and, and with you along uh, as well, discussed the possibility of opening a real institution. So for the last 10 years, we have given courses beginning at the Breck Forum, uh, where I began with the history of materialism. Stanley did very good courses on the Frankfurt School and other you know, schools, uh, civil rights movement, et cetera. And we have continued these courses now for ongoing 10 years of among about three or four teachers, of which we've built up a, a momentum of maybe about 50 to 60 students who periodically come to these lectures. So. The idea now is to really form a left university, a university that would supplant the traditional learning that is not really going on in the schools anymore, that we really find the schools to only be credentializing machines, and that we would offer now in this left university a real curriculum for what we would call sloganeering, an education that really matters. So we have, you know, now started to begin with a new set of classes that, that begin this, this fall, um, uh, September 29th, uh, with a, a smattering of classes mostly based on historical materialism and various issues, the idea of progress, what is the role of philosophy in the future. Um, I know you're doing something on political economy. We can go back mm -hmm. to that and traditional economics versus Marxist and uh, neoclassical economics, and uh, also a class in reading capital. So this is the beginning of us trying to build uh, both um, a, a series of classes that ultimately we would give a certificate for, as well as um, you know continue with a real core curriculum that hopefully could be extended to everything from advanced high schools to you know people in New York City that are completely you know disgusted with the education that they're getting in the regular universities and the offerings across the town. Let me draw you yeah, out. Sure. This is really very important sure. and very interesting. Yeah. What's wrong, in your judgment? You, you're, you're a professor. You've been a professor all your adult life, right. as I have. Yes. How would you, in a short amount of time, put your finger on what is the essence of what's not working, 
or what has disappeared or, or what's wrong with quote unquote higher education? Okay. Um, maybe to give it a political and a historical perspective, I mean, about 30, 35 years ago, there was a massive shift away from the humanities and a liberal arts education. And what happened in the institutions is people did, could get degrees without really learning how to read, think, or write. <laughs> and we are witnessing this increasingly as we go forward. And with, I think, also the contemporary digitalization, if you will, of everyday life, we are really faced with a crisis that, you know, our new generation has a very difficult time thinking, you know, analogically thinking conceptually and, you know, is very good at practice with the technology, but is having a very difficult time really understanding why literature is important, why the history of science is important, why philosophy would be important. So what happens in these institutions, at least in my experience and what I've read and studied for many years, is that the institutions of higher learning are now run like corporations, no longer as sites for learning. And in that moment, they're trying to reproduce the conditions of neoliberalism and have become only about the credentializing, not education for citizenship, not education as a public good, but education as a ticket to a job. And now we're beginning to see that that's not so much the case for a lot of people, given the student debt. So all of these factors running together seem to be, you know, um, you know, part of the crisis that we're facing and what we'd like to address. So yeah. this new left yeah. university yeah. will go against that. In other words, if I'm hearing yes. you right, you will want to have a, a curriculum that, to use the old language, develops in people the ability to understand, analyze, criticize, and therefore improve the society into which they are born. It, it, it teaches you what that society has learned, yes. but also what's missing, yes. what the problems are, and hopefully provides you with materials, tools, to be a critical contributor. Absolutely. And, and this, I mm -hmm. think, is a very widespread feeling that schools, I know in, in a number of universities, they're getting rid of broadly based intellectual study or courses. It's more and more, you know, higher education, voc ed, you know, <laughs> vocationally, exactly. you know, and the justification is is a job. Yeah, the new euphemism is pre-professional. Pre-professional pre education. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And you're right. I mean, in a way, it's it, what has happened in the universities, it's become very mechanical. It is really just meant to reproduce the system it is. We have lost all organicity or all kinds of real development of the human being. And really, education is a transformative experience. Hopefully, people would go to university for change. Now they just go for credentials for, you know. And what job. do you hope will come out of this? What? Tell me, what's the vision you have of what such a new university, if it gets going, what it can achieve? What are you hoping to accomplish with this? Well, I hope we build a political space that people are able to come to and uh, really begin to discuss ideas. I mean, there's nothing more fruitful to have a center, if you will, and I think that's something that's been very lacking in progressive circles, to have real centers of learning. You know, we have a lot of movements, a lot of single-issue politics, et cetera. But part of the goal here is to give, bring a center to, you know, um, uh, to people that really are hungry for ideas, people that really want to learn. And hopefully we would develop, you know, really the mind again <laughs> and, you know, transmit. Because to me, the, the crucial and the most uh, significant crisis we're facing is, is memory really historical memory at this point, that nobody really has a continuation of the past, and especially in terms of the history of progressive, you know, causes and, uh, you know, left causes, if you will, and left thinking. So let me ask yeah, if you yeah. think of yourself as a continuation in another sense. Roughly 100 years ago, a group of left-wing intellectuals, including people like George Bernard Shaw and Sidney and Beatrice Webb in London, mm -hmm. were dissatisfied with conventional education in Great Britain, 
Oxford, Cambridge, and all of that. And so they started what they then called, and which still exists, the London School of Economics, right. to be a different, open, right. really deep thought place, a center, like mm -hmm. you put it. Um, and in a way, the Frankfurt School couldn't really be part of the University of Frankfurt, so it had this little institute sort of on the edge of the university right. for other reasons. But these became monumentally important uh, institutions for changing and developing human thought. You want to do this too? Absolutely. This is exactly what we're you know, gunning for, is to try to create an alternative space for real alternative learning against what has come down, you know, especially during the last 40 years and really has been traditional since time immemorial in mm. terms of dominant, you know, state based, you know, education, you know. Uh, well, it would be interesting and, because it so, would yeah. suggest to me that part of the crisis, in a way, of the United States, of the new directions that we're seeing around us, whether it be uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement or the Bernie Sanders phenomena or the recent election victories of people calling themselves socialists and all that, that here is a new departure in the world of education that reflects, again, a dissatisfaction with where things have come to in the country, mm -hmm. the inequalities, the, the crises, and a desire to forge a new direction. I think it's, it's remarkable. Where would interested students, and for that matter, interested teachers, where would they go? How would they connect to you in order to um, show their interest and maybe participate? Are you welcoming people yes, to do that? Yes, we are welcoming people. We have a whole group of potential teachers already on a list who have come to us just by word of mouth. Uh, we have a website, uh, radicalimagination.institute, which shows what we're about. It, it has our journal situations as well as, you know, the courses that we offer, plus some archival material. We have blogs and other things all there. So people can go there to see what the Institute for Radical Imagination is about and what the left university is in its embryonic form, and they can certainly contact me, and I think later at mpelius underscore at hotmail.com. But anyway, I have no problem answering emails. I spend Question. a lot of time doing that. But uh, so yeah, you, so you we welcome, welcome we welcome all all types of people. In fact, we're going to be doing a, a course on labor history uh, in the uh, spring semester. You know, taught by a labor expert. We're going to be doing all kinds of various things. But what we're real, what I what I'm excited about is building a curriculum, really an actual curriculum where people can come and get a a, a more organic full education, you know, uh, based on the best of the Frankfurt School, the best of the London School of Economics, the best of the organic intellectual, as uh, Antonio Gramsci, you know, termed to what we're really trying to do here. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, we've come to yeah. the end of this part of the okay. show. I want to okay. thank you for being with us. Yeah, I want to thank the audience for being part of that. But I also want to remind you that if you would like to see a continuation of this conversation, please go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash economic update, where this interview will be continued. I look forward to speaking with you again next week. <laughs>